What's up, everybody? My name is Shane Kohler, and this is The Conscious Love Show. Thanks so much for joining me here, where each week I'm sharing true-to-life insights and experiences from my journey and how I've created the loving and committed partnership I have today. I answer your questions and have live discussions with you so I can support you in your specific situation. And I bring in experts and people who know their stuff so we can all learn from their perspectives. Thanks again for checking out the show. Please subscribe on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on the most. And I would love it so much if you'd leave a review and tell people what you think of us. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at The Living Relationship to connect more closely. And I'm grateful to be supporting you on your journey to love. And welcome, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Conscious Love Show podcast. As always, it is a pleasure to be here with you. Looking forward to diving in with another episode. And um, yeah, a lot to cover today, a lot to cover. So I was recently listening to um, a teacher of mine. His name is Bashar. Uh, I've, I've probably spoken about him on Instagram before. I, I imagine I've probably said something about him on the podcast. Um, I know for sure that uh, I share a little bit about him in the Inspired Love program because his um, his methods and his tools and his teaching has been so central to my life. And um, it's just been very, very profound in what I've been able to learn and open up by uh, learning from him. But something uh, I was recently listening to him and something he shared that I thought was just very profound and very powerful is this idea of being unconditionally supported by the universe. And I know when I say that, right, you're unconditionally supported by the universe it sounds like such a beautiful thing, doesn't it? It sounds so so lovely to be unconditionally supported by the universe. And it is a beautiful thing. It is lovely, but that doesn't necessarily mean what a lot of us might think it means, right? When you are unconditionally supported by the universe, and you think about unconditional love is the willingness to love no matter what, right? Like human beings, we don't have unconditional love, right? Like unconditional love is like, will you love me if I cut your head off? Oh, you will? Oh, well, that's unconditional, right? Like no conditions. Like no matter what you do, I will not stop loving you, right? Human beings don't have unconditional love. We don't understand unconditional love. We have conditional love where our love is like, I love you, but I, as long as you meet some certain conditions, you know, like you got to think kind of things we talk about on here, right? You got to show up for me. You got to be consistent. You got to put the effort in. You got to show me how much you want it. You've got to show me that I am important to you. You've got to make me a priority, right? And then I will love you, right? Like that's, that's human love. That's how we operate with love. But the universe supports us unconditionally. And I was thinking about this today and I was kind of thinking about, you know, what I wanted to share on today's podcast. And, you know, I was thinking about what it would really be to love unconditionally. And maybe the closest thing that we could know this in our human lives would be like for a parent, right? And as a parent, like your kids might do all kinds of stuff. They might do things you don't agree with. They might do things you directly oppose. They might make choices that you know are really bad for them, but you love them anyway, right? Like that's probably the closest thing a human being could know to unconditional love would be the way we love our children. And the universe, like we're all like children of the universe, right? And so, but I think what's different between the universe and humans is that as humans, you know, if our child was doing something that we didn't agree with or didn't approve of or didn't want them to do, you know, we might continue to love them. And it's like, I love you, but I'm not going to support you in doing it. I'm not going to provide the means for you to do this thing that I don't agree with, right? Well, the universe actually does. And that I think is, it's such a powerful kind of love but it's it's a kind of love that we can't really understand as human beings. And the best example I think I've ever heard of this, there's a book called Conversations with God. And some of you, if, if you've read the book or if you've heard of the book Conversations with God, tap that heart a few times. I want to know how many of you have heard that book or read that book. But uh, the book Conversations with God, it was written by a man named D uh, Neil Donald Walsh. And um, the story basically goes that this was a man who had reached like absolute despair in his life. 
I think at the time he wrote this book, his wife had left him. He had lost his family and his children. He's like basically completely alone in life. His financial world had like crumbled. He had lost everything financially. Like he's just destitute, lost his wife, lost his kids, like just completely alone in alone in the world, alone in the universe, um, at the point of complete utter despair, like thinking about taking his own life. And he sits down and he, he decides that I'm going to write a letter to God. I'm going to write a letter to God. And he starts writing the letter. And uh, forgive me, I don't remember exactly how the letter starts, but go look at the book. You'll find out. But basically, it starts something to the, something to the effect of like, my life is such a mess. I've, I've lost everything. I'm in utter despair, utter depression. Like, if there is a God answer me because I'm just, I'm at the point of like ready to take my own life. Like it's basically where this book starts and God actually responds. And so this book is a dialogue between this man and God. Now he's obviously writing both parts of it and it's up to you when you read the book to decide for yourself what degree of inspiration you think is there. But I mean, I've found this book personally for me to be one of the most enlightened books out there. It's it's very, very profound. And, you know, it's interesting sometimes when we're at that point of despair, when we're at that point of like total loss or just, you know, like, like hopelessness, there there's a kind of opening, right? It's like our ego has surrendered to a degree in that despair that like we would never be open enough to actually hear God speak until we reach that point of like complete despair. And then suddenly there's something happens in our ego where it's like so defeated that it just opens up and all of a sudden it can receive some inspiration that it couldn't receive before. And so as he's writing this, as he's writing this letter to God and he's saying, my life is so fucked up. I've lost everything. I'm completely alone. I'm at the point of wanting to take my own life. And he's like, basically, what's the point of going on? Like, why should I even live? And, and God responds to him and God says, do you really want to know the answers to these questions? And he, the way he shares the story, he's like, you know, to see his own hand writing these words, it was like kind of shocking to him where he's like, uh, like, where is this coming from? Right. So there was something inspiring him. There was something moving through him. And he, so he writes the, the sentence, you know, do you really want the answers to these questions? And he says, yes, I do. And that begins a dialogue that went on for three books of this man dialoguing with God, asking all of his questions and getting answers to these questions. And um, I'm sharing all of this to say that one of the one of the things they touch on in the book, they touch on so many different things. I mean, every aspect of life in this book. But um, one of the points that he touches on in this book that I found to be particularly profound is he shares that. The, the love of the universe, the like God's love or the love of our soul and our spirit is so total and so complete. And what he shares in this book is that if a soul has a desire to experience something like being abandoned or being abused or being neglected or being left for dead or be, like anything, anything like that that the universe will actually conspire in such a way to create that experience for that soul. And, and basically the way he talks about it in the book is like God saying to him, like, I love you enough to create any experience you want to experience. I love you enough to let you go to the absolute threshold of like darkness as deep as you want to go. And I will support you unconditionally in creating that experience. And actually, from a certain perspective, and this might trigger some of you, a little trigger warning here, right? This might trigger some of you. This might be uncomfortable for some of you. But just see if you can open your mind a little bit and see it from a different perspective. And what, what he says in this book is that, you know, when, when in our human lives we have an abuser and an abused, right? There's the abuser and there's the abused. And it seems that the abuser is the perpetrator and the abused is the victim. And what he's actually suggesting in this book is that the abuser loves the abused so much that they are willing to play that role, 
It's like, if you could think about it like this, it's like, I love you so much that I am willing to drop myself to the level of abuser in order for you to have the experience that your soul is calling for. Now, I, I want to be clear about something I'm saying right now. I'm not condoning abuse, okay? I think as we all grow in consciousness and as we all become more aware, we should stand against abuse, right? And we should stand up for ourselves and say, I'm not going to allow abuse in my life. And that's that's all part of our journey, right? That's all part of what we're here to do is to grow and evolve in that way. But for some of us, we would never even reach the point of owning our power and owning our truth if we hadn't been abused, right? So sometimes the abuse that we experience in life is the very conduit for our awakening. It's the very conduit through which we discover ourselves within that context of abuse and come into our highest truth, come into the greatest version of ourselves that we could be. And so the universe is constantly conspiring to create every experience that our soul is calling out for. And I was thinking about this recently because I've been working with this amazing client who recently hired me and we started working together. And she's just super brilliant and amazing, amazing woman, um, lived an amazing life. And she's, um, she shared with me that in her past, you know, and and she's in her fifties now and in her twenties and her thirties, she, um, she lived a certain kind of lifestyle where she would basically pander to wealthy men to have them take care of her and have them buy her things and, you know, buy her houses and cars and trips and, you know, travel and all this kind of stuff. And basically um, what, what she shared with me is that, you know, and it goes without saying, but a lot of, a lot of that lifestyle that she was living in her twenties and her thirties. And, you know, as she, as she was growing up and coming into herself is that she was, you know, having to do a lot of things that were out of alignment with her values out of alignment with her truth, you know, things that maybe she would feel a lot of shame around things that maybe she would, uh, regret or, you know, but there were, she had to do a lot of things with these men in order to get them to pay for her and, you know, buy her houses, buy her cars, take her on trips, all this kind of stuff. And we've been, uh, we've been really diving into a lot of this and, you know, looking at the trauma that happened in her childhood around money. And how, you know, when she was very young, she developed this intense scarcity around money, which made her feel that she needed to, like, get her hands on security at all costs. And so she basically traded in her worth for financial gain. And we've been we've been exploring a lot of these themes. But, you know, she's out of place now. And, you know, she's she's learned she's grown so much and she's really grown into this incredible woman. And she's at this place now where she's like never again. You know, I am done with these disgusting men that, you know, like use me like that. And, you know, she's really, she's come so far with it. But what we've been talking about recently, and I want to share this because, you know, we had, we, we discussed this on our call the other day and it was so, so powerful is, you know, she's dealing with incredible amounts of resentment and like a a desire to avenge herself, a a desire to avenge her younger self, right? Look at all the abuse and the trauma that I was put through and and I want to get these men back and I want to show them, you know, I want to put them in their place and show them how wrong they are. And I shared something with her. And again, this might trigger some of you, but this is the truth. I said to her, I said, I get it. And it's perfectly valid that you feel that way, given everything you've been through. You know, I, I imagine the abuse and the trauma that you've experienced, like you would want revenge. You would want to avenge yourself. Like that all makes perfect sense. But here's what you've got to understand is that those people who abused you, those people who took advantage of you, who took your financial destitution as an opportunity to buy your worth from you, right? They took your financial destitution as an opportunity to wield power over you and make you their slave or their servant in a way. And what I said to her was that those people were only showing up for you as reflections in the game that you were playing, right? So let me explain this a little bit. There was a certain version of herself that she was choosing to be at that time, 
right? There was a certain version of herself that she was choosing to be. Now she had her reasons for that. And maybe we'll talk about that a little bit, but, but there was a certain way of life that she was choosing to live. And in order for her to live that way of life that she was choosing to live, she needed those men to be who they were because if they didn't exist, she couldn't have been who she wanted to be. Right? She actually needed them to be these lecherous, old, perverted, wealthy men in order for her to be the person that she wanted to be. If they didn't exist in that way, she could not have existed in the way that she was existing. It was a mutual thing. It was a mutual agreement. Now, I get it. On the surface, we look at it and we go, oh, this poor destitute girl. And look at everything she had to do for these disgusting old men. And that's just awful. And that's just horrible. And I, and I get it. I, I mean, on a certain level, I agree, right? Like I'm not, on a certain level, I agree that it's awful. But on another level, I can see the perfection in all of it. I can see that there was a certain trajectory that her life needed to take. There were certain lessons that she needed to learn. There were certain things that she needed to overcome, certain experiences that she needed to have. And she could not have had those experiences. She could not have been who she was without them also being who they were. And this is how life works. And this is why this might be a challenging statement for some of you. But this is why there are no real victims in the universe. There are only creators creating our reality. And we are unconditionally supported by the universe to create any reality we choose. Now, for a lot of people, that's just too much responsibility. And I get that. Like that's that's a tough pill to swallow. Like that's a tough pill to swallow. Like I look at I look at my like my parents and my upbringing and all the kinds of things I went through. And look, like my dad my dad is a real asshole, okay? Like I wouldn't wish him on anyone except myself. That's an interesting thing to say, right? Like I would not wish my dad on anyone but myself. But see I needed my dad. Now, I don't need him now. I haven't talked to my dad in well over a year, maybe even two years at this point. I don't know if I'll ever speak to him again. Maybe I will. We'll, we'll see. I'm not, I'm not against it. But I don't have any need to like have a relationship with him. I've, I've completed that relationship as far as I'm concerned. We're good. He could be who he is. I can be who I am. We don't need to have a relationship. Now, if life leads me in a direction that leads me to have a relationship with him, I'm open to it if it's relevant, if it's necessary. But I don't need that. But there was a time in my life when I did need my dad. You see, there was a time in my life when I was living with my mother. I was 13 years old. My mom and I were like at each other's throat because she was enforcing a really strict religious conditioning on me that I was resisting. After 13 years of dealing with it, I had hit my breaking point. <laughs> Right After 13 years of dealing with it, I was like, I'm done. I can't do it anymore. And we were at each other's throats. We were not getting along. And I needed at that time in my life a parental figure that was going to give me the freedom to be who I wanted to be in the world. And around that time was when my mom and I got into a fight that was of such a great magnitude that she said, fine, go live with your dad. And I called my dad. He didn't often answer the phone, but this time he did. You can't make this stuff up, right? My dad rarely answered the phone. This time he did. And he answered the phone. I said, dad, can I come live with you? And he said, sure. And two weeks later, I was on a plane leaving my life that I had known my entire life up until that point, traveling across the country to go to South Florida to live with a man that I'd met once in my life. And I was abused by this man. I was terrorized by this man. This man introduced me to drugs and alcohol and got me addicted. Like this man was largely the reason I went to jail when I was 18 years old, right? Like this, this, this he was a horrible influence in my life. But here's the thing. He allowed me, he gave me the space to become who I wanted to be at that time in my life. The universe 
God, whatever you want to call it, the universe conspired to create an environment for me to have the freedom to become the person I wanted to be at that time in my life. And this is happening all the time for all of us. Now, again, this is a lot of responsibility for a person to assume because it's so much easier. It's so much easier to point out all the things that went wrong in our life and all the situations in which we were powerless and all the situations in which I had no say or I couldn't do it or I, you know, all the different kinds of situations. And it's so much easier to point to those things and to feel like a victim about it and to let ourselves off the hook, right? Like when I, when I can make myself a victim, I have no responsibility anymore. It's not my fault. I didn't do it. Now I want to share something because this woman I was sharing about earlier, this, uh, this client I've been working with, right? And, and I said to her, I said, these men were only showing up for you as a reflection of the game that you set up for them. You set up a game for these men and they just played into your game and you needed them to be who they were in order for you to play the game that you were playing. But then I also said to her, I said this, but that doesn't mean it's your fault either because you just played into the game that was set up for you. Right now, if we look back, and I don't want to get into all of this, but if we look back at her childhood, we look back at who her parents were, we look back at how the events unfolded and how she played into those events and the trauma that she experienced and how that trauma shaped her psyche and how it shaped her relationship with life and men and everything else, right? And if we look at all of that, we can see how she just played into a game that was set up for her. And in her playing into that game, she set up a game for these other men and they played into that. And it just goes on and on and on. And, and who set up the game for her? Well, we could say her parents or her early childhood environment, like that set up the game for her. Well, who set up that game? Well, her parents and, and the people who are around that. But where did that come from? It came, up, it came from the game that was set up for them. And they just played into that game. And their parents did it and their grandparents did it and on and on and on. And how far back can you go to see where it actually started? There is no beginning. There is no end. It's, it goes on forever. And this is why there are no real victims in the world. Because here's the thing. If you want to be a victim, if you want to be a victim, if you want to say, you know, I was abused when I was a child and then, you know, I was, I was rejected at school and I never fit in at school and nobody liked me at school. And then when I, when I became an adult, I had to get a shitty job that I don't like just to make ends meet. And now I spend all my time working a job that I hate just to barely make enough to make ends meet. And, and this is my life and I had no choice and no power in it. And I was forced into this situation and I want to be a victim to it, right? Or, or I am a victim to it, right? It was not my choosing. It happened to me. I didn't create it. It happened to me, right? That's, that's the definition of being a victim is it happened to me rather than I created it. Now, if you want to choose that perspective in life, you can. And this is the amazing thing about the universe is you will be 100% supported in that creation. So if I choose, I'm a victim. I have no power in my life. I have no say. Circumstances happen to me and I'm at the mercy of people and circumstances and it's all I can do to just barely get by in this world. Like if you want to choose that perspective, the universe will support you in creating an entire external reality that reflects that perspective. You see, if you are a victim, you need perpetrators. And the universe, in its magnificent, unconditional love for you, will put perpetrators all around you. And they're just going to perpetrate all over you, right? They're just going to take from you and hurt you and disregard you. And, do, and every time they do it, you'll believe more that you're a victim and you'll create more perpetrators around you and they'll hurt you more and you'll believe more that you're a victim and you'll attract more of it and they'll do it and you'll feel it and on and on and on the cycle goes. And you will be right. 
you will be 100% right that you're a victim. And because, because you're endowed with this unconditional creative power, like this is the thing, God does not give a flying fuck what you do with your power. I know it's usually not said like that, not said like that when you go to church, right? But it's the truth. God is not sitting up there going, oh, you're doing good with your power and you're doing bad with your power and you need to do better with your power and you should do something different. Like, no, that, that's what humans do. But God is not up there doing that. God is saying, create, unlimited, forever, anything and everything and on and on and on. And if you feel like you're a victim for 3,000 lifetimes, eventually you'll break out of it. And I'm not in a hurry. I have the entirety of creation here. So take your time. Be a victim for as many thousands of lifetimes as you want to be. And when you're ready to play a different game, you'll be unconditionally supported in that new game. And you can play whatever game you want and you will always be 100% supported by the universe in that game. And so the question becomes, what kind of game do you want to play? What kind of support do you want to ask the universe for? Because here's the thing, is in the same way that if you decide to be a victim, the universe will fill your life with perpetrators and you can spend your whole life being a victim and it'll just never stop. It'll just go on and on and on and on and on. But if you wanted to be the luckiest person in the world, you could be that too. See, if you wanted to define yourself as I am the luckiest person in the world, things just happen for me in the most incredible ways. Things just, just poof, oh, there it is. Oh, wow, oh, amazing. I just, I just stumble into the right things at the right time. I don't even have to try. It just happens, just unfolds. Find the right relationship at the right time. Find the right job at the right time. Money just comes out of nowhere. It falls into my lap. Like, you know, like I, I, I use my talents in this incredible intuitive way where I just know exactly where to say or do the right thing. Like if you wanted to create that belief about yourself, you would be unconditionally supported in creating that belief. And the universe would fill your life with all kinds of evidence to support that belief. And you would go around and you'd be like, oh, wow. Like, and you just start collecting evidence. She'd be like, oh, there's some evidence. There's some evidence. Oh, wow. Everywhere I go, I see more evidence. I'm the luckiest person in the world. But you would first have to want that. You would first have to want that. Now, I know some of you might be listening to this and you might say, well, Shane, I want to be the luckiest person in the world. Why hasn't it happened yet? Because we don't always want what we think we want. And this is where you've really got to start to understand your psyche in a more complete way. Because the psyche is complex. And let me, let me give an example here. Your ego, and just, I know for those of you who listen to the podcast, for those of you who've been with me for a long time, I've talked in depth about the ego. But for those of you who are maybe just joining in or with me live today, you've never heard the podcast before, I want to make sure you understand what I'm talking about. The ego is the protective part of your consciousness. Okay, the ego does not know you as a spiritual being. The ego does not know you as an eternal being. The ego does not know you as a child of the universe or a child of God. Like the ego doesn't know anything about that. The ego knows you as a physical being who was born into this world and the ego has one goal and that's to try to keep you alive. Right? And we need the ego. Like if we didn't have the ego, we'd be walking in front of buses and shit, right? So like we need the ego. The ego is helpful to a certain extent. But its one goal is to keep us alive. And the ego doesn't really know anything of love. The ego only really knows of fear because fear is the mechanism through which it keeps us alive, right? The ego looks out in the world and it sees something scary and it goes, whoa, 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 stay away from that. And that's how it keeps you alive. And so what the ego has done is it has filled your consciousness with fear-based belief systems. It makes you scared of everything. And by being scared of everything, 
it keeps you in a small box that it feels is safe, that it feels will keep you alive. Now, I said the ego's job is to keep you alive. And from an evolutionary standpoint, it is. But in our modern society, which is really distorted and twisted for all sorts of reasons, our egos are also distorted and twisted, right? So, you know, maybe for my dog, my dog's ego just keeps him alive. But for humans, our egos are overdeveloped. And so not only do they just keep us alive, but they keep us constantly on guard for any shred of pain, disappointment, dissatisfaction, hurt, sadness, loss, grief, etc. And our egos are constantly on guard for any sign of pain. And they're constantly coaching us to run away from pain and towards pleasure. Now, why is this a problem? Well, it's a problem because so much of our evolution requires us to deal with our pain. So, so much of our evolution requires us to deal with the parts of our life and ourselves that our ego is telling us to avoid. And so, if you were to take on a belief like, I'm the luckiest person in the world, well, there is a lot that you would have to experience in that belief. There is a lot that you would have to open up for yourself in that belief that's just outside of your comfort zone. It's just unfamiliar territory. You know, if you've been living your whole life as a victim of circumstance with a sense of powerlessness about yourself, with a sense of not being connected to the fact that you are an unlimited creator, right? And if you've been living your life within this certain view of yourself, and now you say, I want to become the luckiest person in the world. I want to live a life where the most beautiful things just unfold for me in the most natural ways, right? Well, there's a process of transitioning from being a victim to being the luckiest person in the world. And the ego, the part of your consciousness that is trying to protect you, is going to fight to keep you in a victim mentality because it feels like a victim mentality is safe. If you were to let go of this victim mentality, all of a sudden the ego goes, well, if you're not a victim, then that means... Everything that you've been blaming other people for your whole life were actually consequences of your own creative ability. And the ego's like, no, 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 you don't want to own that. That's too painful. You see, we've spent your whole life creating a very elaborate system of blame where you don't have to be responsible for any of it. Why are you going to take it on now, right? Like this is how, this is how the ego is framing these situations. And so there's a process of transitioning from the old world, the old identity, the old view of self to the new world, the new identity, the new view of self. And by the way, I just, I want to put this in here because this is exactly what the Inspired Love Program does, right? The Inspired Love Program is about making this leap from the old world to the new world. And the truth is, is that a lot of us are continuing to create the same things over and over and over and over and over again. And we don't know how to stop. You see, it's not that you're not supported by the universe. It's not that the potential isn't there. It's not that the possibility isn't available to you. It's that you're so addicted to the cycles of recreating the same stuff over and over and over and over and over again. That is so comfortable and so familiar to you that you just don't know how to stop. And I want to say, if you're in that position, if you're in that place where you're continuing to manifest the same types of relationships, the same types of non-committal people, getting ghosted over and over and over again, Attracting people who want to pen pal with you for six months, but never want to take the relationship to any kind of real level, right? Like if you're attracting these things over and over and over again, well, you've got to ask yourself, what's going on inside of me that I'm actually asking the universe for this? And I remember like when I was first introduced to this conversation and when I was introduced to this conversation, the way it was introduced to me is that I was told that you have payoffs, right? Everything in your life that you say you don't want, 
Everything in your life that you say, well, I don't want this, or this is not my ideal, or this is not what I'm looking for, right? But it's still there. Well, it's there because you're getting some kind of payoff from it. You're getting some kind of secret, sneaky benefit. And, and on the surface, you go out and you tell everyone, I hate this. This is the bane of my existence. I can't stand it. It's so hard. It hurts so much. I want it to stop. I want it to quit. But underneath it, you're getting a little sneaky payoff for it. And like, so let's, let's make this real, right? So what might be the little sneaky payoff you're getting? Let's say that you are consistently attracting non-committal men. Let's just say that, for example right? You're attracting non-committal men with your creative power. I want you to really get this. With your infinite ability to create anything, with the whole support of the universe behind you to create and manifest anything in your life, what you have chosen to create are a consistent string of non-committal men. One after another, after another, after another, just waste your time. Now, why on earth would someone do that? Why on earth would someone do that? Well, let's, let's think about that for a moment. Because maybe, maybe when you were young, I'm just, these are hypotheticals. Now you'll have to find the truth for you, but I'm just going to give you some examples. Maybe when you were young, you were in an intimate situation with your parents, right? Which I, I mean, most of us like, our relationship with our parents is like the most intimate relationship we've ever known until we really meet someone that we go all the way with. But for, for like most people in the world, you have never known a relationship that even came close to as intimate as your relationship was with your parents. And I don't mean that sexually in any sense, for those of you who might think that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about emotionally intimate. Now, If you had a very intimate relationship with your parents and you were very hurt by that relationship, just say hypothetically, you had a very intimate relationship with your parents and you were very hurt by that relationship. Maybe they didn't honor your truth. Maybe they restricted you. Maybe they punished you. Maybe they put you down. Maybe they criticized you. Maybe they held you back from things that you really wanted to do in your life. Maybe they limited you. Maybe they judged you. Maybe they compared you to other kids or whatever, right? And maybe that is what you think intimacy is. And maybe on a subconscious level, your ego has developed a belief that says, when I become that intimate with someone, I am punished, I am neglected, my authenticity and my truth are suffocated out of me. I'm forced to be someone I'm not. I'm judged. I'm criticized. I'm compared to other people. And so in your ego, you feel that it is safer to attract non-committal people than it is to actually become that intimate with someone. Your ego, now I understand there's another part of you. You're not all the ego, right? There's another part of you that goes, but I want to be loved. I want to be held. I want that special someone in my life. I get that. That's there and that's real too. But you've got to ask yourself, where am I creating from? Am I creating from this beautiful vision of love that I want to have in my life? Or am I creating from my traumatic past? And, and the truth is, like, this is just a fact, is that 99% of the people in the world are creating from their traumatic past. And it, it just simply because we've never been taught to do otherwise. Like, I learned to do otherwise, but let me tell you, like, my mom did not teach me. My dad did not teach me. None of my teachers in school taught me, right? So how did I learn? I really had to go way out of my way, which turned out to be on my way, right? Turns out I was actually on my way, but I felt like I was going way out of my way to go to trainings and seminars and read books and work with coaches. And I mean, this has been over a decade long journey of me opening up this world for myself. And that journey had stages, right? There was a stage when I was brand new. I had no skills. I was just barely comprehending these ideas and trying them on. 
And I was still very afraid of so many things in life. I was afraid of women, relationships, money, my career of being abandoned, of being involved with someone and being left or hurt or rejected or having them choose someone else over me, right? I still had all this fear. And so, yes, I'm entertaining these ideas. I'm a powerful creator. I'm a manifester. I have the full support of the universe. But those are just nice ideas as long as you're full of fear. There's a process of opening yourself up that in my experience has not been a fast process. Now, I'll say within a context of a program like Inspired Love, you can go a long way in 90 days. And we have plenty of graduates who can, t- who can attest to that. And I've done plenty of programs in my life that I feel like have taken me from you know, one paradigm of existence to a whole new paradigm of existence. And they have been incredibly beneficial. But even that was only a stage. Right? Even that was only a step. And there were more steps that needed to be taken after that. And what we're really doing as we step out of our trauma and into our role as as the creator that we were born to be, what we're really doing, if we put it into one word or one sentence, is you're just letting go of fear. All you're doing is you're choosing to be fearless enough to live the life that you really want to live. And if I were to ask any one of you right now, and and I want you to ask yourself this as I'm asking you, if I were to ask any one of you right now, if there were no conditions, if there were no rules, if you could be doing anything you wanted to be doing in life right now, there were no rules, no conditions, what would you be doing? And you would come up with a whole list. Oh, I'd be traveling. I'd be whatever. I'd be in a relationship. I'd be dating. I'd be adventuring. I'd be doing crazy stuff. I'd be doing art. I'd be doing some kind of passionate activity. I would quit my job. I would write all this stuff. And then I say, okay, well, why aren't you doing that stuff? And if you really ask yourself that question, you'd say, if I could do, if I could do anything right now, I would quit my job and travel the world. Okay. Well, why aren't you doing that? And the answer is fear. See within your ego, within your survival structure, you have framed it somehow that doing something that, that is less than your highest calling doing something that is less less than the greatest expression of who you could possibly be, doing something less than that is somehow safer than doing that. And if you're honest, you cannot deny it. If If you really look and you're really honest, you cannot deny it, that you have worked it out in your belief system That being less than the absolute full expression of myself is safer than being the full expression of myself. And it's really not that hard to see this. Like I I talk to clients all the time. It's like, well, you know, I I was talking to a client recently and and I I asked her a similar question. I said, like, you know, if, if you were to just, if you were to just be yourself without any idea of filtering yourself based on what you think people want to see or what you think is acceptable, what would be the difference? She said, well, I would be louder. I said, louder. Okay. Awesome. So you can see in that when she says louder, she can see that everywhere she goes every day in every situation, to some degree, she is silencing herself. Maybe it's in the way she dresses. Maybe she would dress louder. But ooh, that's going to draw too much attention. People are going to look at me. People are going to judge me. People are going to criticize me. So maybe I should just wear black and gray and just keep it neutral, right? Or maybe she would speak up more. Maybe she would give her ideas in that business meeting. Maybe she would challenge a coworker. Maybe she would give some direct feedback. Maybe she would walk up to that guy at the coffee shop and say, here's my number if you want to call me. Right? Those are examples of what it would be like to be louder. 
but everywhere she goes, every day in every situation, to some degree, and maybe it's a small degree in some situations, maybe it's a larger degree in other situations, but to some degree, she is silencing herself. And then the same person goes, I don't know why I can't find a relationship. And with lots of love, I say to her, I say, well, maybe if you were actually being you everywhere you go, you would get more people's attention. Maybe if you were being louder, and I want to be clear, I'm not saying that you should be louder. When I asked her who she would be if she wasn't operating from these limitations, she said she would be louder. You've got to figure out what you would be. Maybe it's louder, maybe it's something else. This is what she said, right? But maybe if she was being louder, if she was being more herself, if she wasn't allowing her fear to tell her who she should be and who she shouldn't be, maybe she would attract a lot more people. And you see, she is so supported by the universe that as long as she believes she needs to silence herself, she's going to create all situations where being my authentic self isn't acceptable. The people around me wouldn't like me if I was louder. I would be judged or criticized. I would lose my job. I would be ignored. I would be ostracized. I would be ridiculed. And because she is so completely supported by the universe, the universe will actually put all those people around her to make sure that she continues to silence herself so she can be right about what she believes. You know, I was talking to another client recently and I just, as I'm talking about this, all these, I, all these memories are coming to me of different conversations we've had, but you know, I was talking to another client recently and she said to me, she said, you know, I just, I just realized that my whole life I've been dumbing myself down to be a version of myself that I thought was acceptable by other people. And she looks at her past relationships and she says, my whole, like every relationship I've been in, I was never really me. Every single relationship I've been in my whole life, I was never really me. I was always a limited version of myself that I thought would fit in to what that person wanted. I was a limited version of myself that I thought would make that person love me. And God, that hurts, right? Like that's just, you know, it just hurts so much to love someone so much and to be giving them everything you have to give, but never feel like it's okay to be yourself with that person. You have to bend over backwards to give them everything they want to make them happy, to be the partner that they want to have, to be attracted to them, to be interesting to them, to be liked by them, to be loved by them. But you can never be yourself. And why on earth would anyone ever sign up for that? Like, I mean, really think about that. And I know a lot of you have been in that position. I've been in that position. But we've got to ask ourselves, why on earth would I ever sign up for something like that? Why on earth would I ever willingly agree to be in a position where I can't be me just to make someone else happy? And call that love. Like, how, how the fuck is that love? Why on earth would I sign up to that? Well, I must have worked it out within my belief system that love is scarce, that love is hard to find, that I am unworthy of it, right? Like, so if I, if I compare myself to all the other eligible people out there, well, somehow they're a lot higher up on the, on the list than I am. Like there are all these amazing people out there and I'm like down here on the list. So, you know, maybe they could have it, but I can't have it. So I better just take what I can get. 
And if this person's the best I can get, then I just better bend over backwards and turn myself inside out to make them happy because God forbid I lose them. That would be the worst thing ever. God forbid I lose someone that I can't even be myself with. Holy shit. Do you see the insanity in this? And if you've worked it out within your belief system that that's the way it is, then God's going to be like, okay, that's the way it is. You're the creator. I endow you with all my power to have it be so. Enjoy that. Spend a couple thousand lifetimes doing that. Maybe you'll get tired of it. Maybe you'll choose something else. You know, I've, I've, uh, I've heard it said before that we don't ask too much from life. We ask too little. You know, some of us are, some of us are sitting there going, I don't want much. I just want to be loved. I just want, I just want a partner to come home to and hold me and kiss me and tell me good night and, and cherish me and appreciate me. Is that so much to ask? I'm not asking for much. Like, why can't I just have that? And here's my answer. Are you ready for this? The reason you can't just have that is because you're only asking for that. Like, I want you to think about that question for a moment. When I sit there and I say, I just want this. Is that too much to ask? Why can't I just have this? How must you see yourself? You must see yourself as someone who is deprived, as someone who is unworthy, as someone who doesn't deserve the absolute, the most, the magnificent. That's why you sit there and say, I just want this little thing. Is that too much to ask? And because you're putting yourself in the position of being this little person who just wants this little thing, and is that too much to ask? That's the reason you'll never even have that little thing. Because you've got to ask for more. You've got to say, I want it all in life. I want that amazing relationship. I want to live in a beautiful home. I want the ability to travel. I want to be surrounded by loving friends and family. I want to have the best dog in the world. Right? I want to be able to spend time in nature. I want to be able to take care of my body. I want to be able to exercise every day. And I want to be able to eat healthy foods. And I want to have energy. And I want to feel alive. And I want to look good. And I want to look in the mirror and feel good about the person that I am. And I want to do work that's meaningful. And on and on and on. And when you take that stance in life, when you choose that stance in life, that's when you're recognizing who you truly are as the creator that could have all of that. And that's when you will have that and more. And I want to be clear, this isn't arrogance. Like arrogance is the wrong energy. If you're being arrogant about it, you might get somewhere in this direction, but it's only going to take you so far. You know, just just the very fact that your arrogance allows you to believe that you deserve to have it and that, you know, it's possible for you, like that will take you to a certain extent. But it's only going to take you so far because you're going to miss the biggest point. You're going to miss the biggest point. And the biggest point is that you are, yes, an amazing creator endowed with unlimited power. But you are more than that, right? So wait, let me, let me say that a little bit differently. Yes, you are an endowed, you are, yes, you are a creator endowed with unlimited power but so is everyone else. So I'm not arrogant because I'm not claim, like arrogance would be to claim something for myself that everyone else doesn't have. That's arrogance. This isn't arrogance. It's actually humble because I'm claiming for myself the birthright that we are all given as children of the universe, as children of God. I'm claiming for myself the birthright that we are all given. And when I own that for myself, 
I become a demonstration to other people about what is possible. So it's not like I'm taking it for myself and like, ha ha, you don't get any. No, it's like I'm taking it for myself and I'm becoming a living demonstration for it in the world and I'm showing everyone else this is what's actually possible. We're no different. If I can have it, you can have it too. Like I've shared my story here and I'll share it again. I mean, I don't, no reason not to, but like, I want you to understand that a lot of you who are going to hear this message had way better odds in life than I had. Like, I mean, I was born into poverty. I had a religious extremist mother. I had an alcoholic, drug addict, abusive father. When I was 18 years old, I went to jail for two years. I found myself at 21 years old, like just out of jail, not a single family member around to support me, completely broken, destitute, starting my life from scratch. That's where I was at 21 years old. Like a lot of you were in college at 21 years old. A lot of you were like in much better positions at 21 years old. And I'm, I'm not saying this to compare. What I'm saying is like, if it could work for me, it could work for anybody. And yes, some of you may have been in a worse position than me, and I'm not denying that. But it doesn't change the truth. It could still work for you. There are people who've come from way worse positions than me and are way ahead of me. Because it's not about what's happened to us. It is never about what's happened to us in life. It's about our relationship with what's happened to us. You know, some of you are out there in the dating world right now, and I get it. It's it's hard. It sucks. I was there. I get it. And some of you are out in the dating world right now and you're dealing with the lack of honesty and the lack of commitment and the flakiness and the ghosting and the being treated like a number. And you're going through all of this stuff and it's hard and it sucks and it's painful and you might cry yourself to sleep at night sometimes. And you know, like I get it. I get it. Like it, it's, it's a challenging, it's a challenging path to be on. There's no denying that. It's a challenging path to be on. But your relationship with that path will determine your results. Your relationship with that path will determine your results. And so if you go through this being ghosted, non-committal, someone wants to pen pal for six months, but they'll never ask you on a date. And you're going through all this frustrating stuff and guys that just want you for sex and everything else you can imagine. How are you relating to it? Are you becoming wiser because of it? Are you becoming deeper because of it? Is your heart becoming more open as a result of this? Are you finding it easier and easier to navigate these dates, to navigate these experiences, to bring up these difficult conversations, to ask for what you want, to talk openly about this is what I'm looking for, this is the kind of life I want to have, this kind of relationship I want to have? Are you leaning into all of this Are you evolving within this curriculum that you're in right now? Or are you resisting? Are you fighting it? Are you being a victim to it? Are you being hopeless about it? Are you using every disappointment as evidence to add to your old identity that tells you it's never possible? And with every disappointing experience you encounter, are you affirming the belief that this is never going to happen for you and showing up to each subsequent date with more hopelessness, more frustration to the point where you don't even give the person a chance. You've already decided it's not going to work before you even show up. I'll tell you, this is what a lot of people are doing out there. I know because I talk to them every day. 
So what are you doing? How are you relating with this whole experience? Because I'm going to tell you what it's for. Like some of you might wonder, you might be like, what is it all for? Like, why do I have to go through all these experiences of like non-committal and waiting by the phone and, you know, getting involved with someone just to have them disappear? Like, what is it all for? Like, why can't I just find my person already? And I'm going to tell you what it's all for. Do you really want the answer? Going back to earlier with the conversations with God thing, right? Do you really want the answer to the questions you're asking? Because if you really get the answer to these questions, it's going to force you to alter your relationship with it. And some of you don't want to alter your relationship with it. But here's what it's for. It's teaching you not to take things so personally. It's teaching you to give people the freedom to let them be who they are without having an attachment to who they're supposed to be for you. It's teaching you to not have your happiness be conditional on what another person wants you for or doesn't want you for. It's teaching you to be fulfilled enough within yourself and your own life that someone's rejection of you does not wreck your own identity. It's teaching you to be open-hearted enough to continue to love and love and love even when you're not getting what you want from other people. And can you still show up with love even when the other person isn't necessarily giving you what you want? And I want you to know this. Every single thing I just mentioned is an essential relationship skill when you're in a partnership with another person. Every single thing I just mentioned is an essential skill that you need in partnership with another person. And so all these experiences that you're having right now are training you to be in a relationship. Now, the next time you get ghosted, can you receive the experience like that? Can you say, ah, what a beautiful opportunity to let this person make their own choices and not be attached to how they show up for me? What a beautiful opportunity. Like, thank you, God. Thank you, universe, for giving me the opportunity to practice letting someone choose who they want to be and not make it about myself. And I know that when I have a partner in my life, there are going to be times that they are going to choose who they want to be. And I'm going to be tempted to take that personally. And I know that this experience right now with this person ghosting me is an amazing opportunity to learn something in the deepest way so it doesn't create a problem with my partner when I meet them. Can you receive it like that? Can you understand that these people who ghost you or mistreat you or disregard you or just try to use you for sex or whatever it is, can you understand that these people are a part of your own creation that you have attracted in for your benefit so you can grow through the experience? Like, can you really let that in? Can you really accept that? Can you really start to see life in this way? Because I know all of you have heard this before. It's, it's, this is like fundamental life wisdom. The lesson will keep reappearing until you learn it. Some of you are going, oh my God, will people just stop ghosting me and love me? And I'm going to say, well, not until you learn how to deal with someone ghosting you in the right way. Because the lesson is going to keep appearing until you learn it. If people are ghosting you, that's not by accident. Like, look, I have clients who get ghosted all the time and clients who never get ghosted. And I'm not saying that the client who never gets ghosted is better than the one who gets ghosted all the time. What I'm saying is they are attracting different experiences that are relevant for their stage of learning. The person who never gets ghosted doesn't need to be ghosted. That's not a relevant experience for them. 
The person who does needs that. It's a relevant experience for them. And there's no judgment here. One's not good or bad or right or wrong. It just, it is what is. You are going to call into your life the experiences that you need to evolve in the way that is relevant for you. The orchestration of this synchronistically is beyond what our minds can even conceive of. But it is beautiful and powerful and true. And the path to everything you want in life begins with you choosing to learn the lesson that is in front of you right now. You see, we're so concerned about, oh my God, if this doesn't happen, then this won't happen, then this won't happen, then this won't happen, and then I won't get what I want. Cut all that out. Drop it. Forget it. What's in front of you right now? Deal with that in the best possible way and let that moment take care of itself. I said to my wife yesterday, we were talking about this, and I said, what I'm doing in my work right now and in, in you know, growing this brand, growing the podcast, growing the, you know, my uh, Instagram and my program and all this, I, I said to my wife, I said, what I am doing in the program right now is so massive and there is so much happening at any one time that I can't even begin to wrap my mind around all of it. I can't even begin to keep track of it all or understand it. The only thing I know is that when I wake up in the morning, I have a list of tasks to complete that day. And the only thing I can do is complete those tasks and trust the outcome. Because if I tried to control every aspect of what's happening here, I would be ripping my hair out and full of anxiety and stressed out all the time. And I would actually be less of a service to the people that I'm trying to serve. And it's, it's no different with you. Whatever's in front of you right now, that's your curriculum for today. Make today a masterpiece. Make your relationship with your life and every domain of it today a masterpiece. Make today a work of art. Show up to every domain of your life today like it's a work of art. And if you can go to sleep tonight knowing you did that, rest assured that you have done everything you needed to do in life today. And get up tomorrow and do it again. And get up the day after that and do it again. And the day after that and do it again. And every single day, show up to the curriculum of your life 100%. Make it a masterpiece. Make it a work of art. And trust the creative ability of the universe behind you to bring it into being. You don't have to do anything more than that. You don't have to figure it all out. You don't have to create the trajectory and the game plan and navigate every step of the way. You don't have to do all of that. You just got to work with what's in front of you right now. Learn the lessons that are in front of you right now and let that next step take care of itself. And trust. Trust that the creative power that is behind you is so much greater and so much wiser than you could ever imagine. Like you trying to figure all of that out is an impossible task. It can't be done. The good news is you don't need to. All right. With that, I want to open up for some questions. Um, I've seen a few questions come in now. If anyone has questions, just go ahead, drop them in the chat. As always, I'll take as many as I can. And I'm just going to scroll back through here and, uh, and see what questions we have coming in already. Go ahead, drop your questions in the chat. We'll get to as many of them as we can. So Jess Lorenko asks, is it like our egos are always looking for validation? And as I said, the, the short answer is yes, but I want to... I want to expand on that a little bit because the ego, the ego is always trying to feel safe. The ego is always trying to feel okay. Like the ego is always looking for, and actually I really want you to get what I'm about to share because 
Like this, if you really understand what I'm about to share, you will understand all of your problems. It's, it's because it's all in the mind, right? We don't have any real problems in life. The problems we create in, in our mind. Yes, we have real challenges in life. We have things we need to deal with, things we need to confront, things that we're going to struggle with and work with. Yes, we do have those things, but we don't have real challenge or excuse me. We don't have real problems. Problems are something we create in our mind around our challenges. So let me, let me expand on this because the ego is always trying to just feel okay. The ego is always just trying to feel good, just trying to feel like things are right. And the ego is constantly trying to create the impossible. It's trying to create a state of no change, right? It's trying to create a state of where I get everything exactly where I want it. I get my finances in the place I want them. I get my relationship in the place I want it. I get my kids in the place I want them. I live in the house I want. You know, our lawn is perfectly green and watered and, you know, our house is clean, right? Like, like just the ego is always trying to get everything to the state of perfection where nothing is changing. And if you think about it, like look at your own mind and ask yourself, like, isn't that what you're working towards to some degree? Like every day when you get up in the morning, like we have this, like, I'll just share like my wife right now. Like, what are we working on? Well, we bought a house and like most of the rooms in our house are still empty and we have a deck going up outside. Like we've lived in the house for six months. We're just now getting our deck put in. We've been living without a deck, you know, like we can't even walk out our back door because it's just a drop off. Right. So like we're living in this, in this house, um, that's like half empty and, you know, we're just now getting a deck in and, you know, my wife, uh, is, she went through chemotherapy a couple of years ago. She's diagnosed with breast cancer. So she's working on getting her health together and she's been working with some doctors to get her health ready so that, you know, we can have a baby in the next year. And I'm working on growing the business and I just launched the Inspired Love Unlimited program. And that's like a, a new version of Inspired Love where we have a lifetime membership and we're adding incredible value. And so I'm working like from sun up till, you know, late at night every day, trying to get all the pieces of this program in place and make sure all the students are taken care of. And there's all this stuff, right? So this is all the things we're working on in our life. And we have this like weird idea that someday all the house is going to be full of furniture and the deck will be ready and we'll have our baby and you know, the, the program will take off and get to where it's supposed to be. And, and like, and in our minds, we think we're working towards some future state of perfection. That doesn't exist. Right? Like it doesn't exist. Like once all of that happens, like by the time everything I just mentioned, the house and the furniture and the deck and the baby and all this, like once it all happens, there is going to be a whole new set of challenges on the other side of that, right? Like you see that, right? Like then we're going to be paying property taxes and then, you know, we're going to deal with, oh, well, enrollment's down in the program. How do we get more people into it? And now we're going to have a crying baby who never sleeps. And like, we don't sleep at night because the baby keeps us up. And now we're trying to figure out how to handle all our other commitments in life without any sleep. And right, this is just life. This is just the way it goes. There is always something. There is always something that the ego perceives as a threat. And so the ego is trying to achieve the impossible. The ego is constantly working to go, we need to fix this. We need to fix this. You know, once the baby starts sleeping again, then things will get better. You know, once I have X amount of people in my program, then things will get better. Once our house is full of furniture, then things will get better. No, they won't. They'll just be different. And some things will be better and some things will be worse and life will just keep going on, right? Like, like you've got to understand this is life. You will never, ever reach a point where everything is good. And the, the, whole, the whole thing is, is that everything is good now. You've just got to be able to see it. You've got to be able to see that you don't need the house full of furniture to be happy. You don't need the deck done to be happy. You don't need your health to be perfect or the baby to be born or the program to be full of people to be happy. Like you don't need those things to be happy. Happiness can be found in the process of creation. And so what we're all kind of struggling with as human beings is our egos that constantly feel like they're under threat. They constantly feel like they're in danger. They constantly feel like they don't have what they need or they're not getting what they want or they're not fulfilled or things won't be good until X, Y, or Z happens, right? This is how the ego operates. 
And so the ego is constantly telling us, you're not okay. You're not okay. You're not okay. You need to do this. You need to do that. You'll be okay. Like, here's a really obvious example. When you're sitting by your phone waiting for that person to text you, I know none of you have ever done that, right? <laughs> when you're sitting by the phone waiting for that person to text you, your ego says, you're not okay right now, but when they text you, you'll be okay. And then you get that text, you go, oh, thank God, I'm okay. And then five minutes later, you're waiting for the next text and you don't feel okay again. And you will be trapped in this for your entire life until you finally get it that it's okay if that person doesn't text you. If they never texted you again, it's okay. And when you can live in the spaciousness of it's okay, if they text me, it's okay, if they don't text me, okay. And yes, my ego is freaking out and it's going, they haven't texted you in six hours. What are they doing? Are they with someone else? Are they forgetting about you? Are they losing interest? Maybe you should text them. And your ego's all in your mind doing all this stuff. And you've got to have the spaciousness to even say to your ego, it's okay. They'll text me when they get around to it. If we fall in love and live happily ever after, that's cool. If they ghost me and we never talk again, that's cool. And you've got to actually be able to coach your ego because your ego is like a chicken with its head cut off. It's like frantically running around, terrified, on high alert for any threat, any problem, and it will always be that way. And most of us have been living kind of under the thumb of our ego, right? Where our ego is in charge and our ego is constantly telling us, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, you got to fix this, you won't be okay until you fix this, right? Like that's how we live. And what we need to do is raise ourselves above our ego. The ego's still there. It's still trying to keep you alive. It's still afraid of everything. That's fine. That's its job. It's just doing its job. But it only matters when you're under its thumb. That's when it sucks. When you raise yourself above the ego, then you just let the ego do its thing. It's like, it's like, imagine if you had a little child running around that was like doing crazy stuff all the time. And I know that might drive you crazy, right? Well, you've got to change your relationship with it, right? So if you had a child running around doing crazy stuff all the time, and this child is your ego, I understand if it was an actual child, you might, you know, not let them do everything. But if it was your ego, you would just let them run around. And you kind of tune them out. Like I said this uh, in, in the program, I was like, you know, imagine that the TV is running in the background and you're working on something, but you have the TV on in the background, right? Well, your ego is like the TV in the background. You're paying attention to the thing that you're focused on. And your ego is running in the background, but, you know, it's no different than if you're working on your computer and the TV's on in the background. You're not listening to the TV. It's just background noise. You've got to start to treat your ego like background noise. So when you're waiting by your phone for that person to call or text you, the ego's going, they haven't texted in six hours. What are they doing? And you just treat it like background noise. You're like, well, you know what? I'm just going to make myself dinner. I'm just going to watch my show. I'm just going to call a friend. I'm just going to go for a walk. I'm just going to go to the gym. I'm just going to play with my puppy. I'm just going to do my life. And yeah, there's a little background noise going on, but I'm not really that invested in it. You've got to create enough space between yourself and your ego. That's the only way that you will ever find peace in life. If you don't do that, if you don't create that space, you will constantly live in a high stress, frantic, anxiety driven version of yourself. You will never have peace. You will never feel empowered. You will never feel capable of creating the things you want in life. You will always feel under threat. You will always be desperately seeking validation because that's what the ego does. So yeah, great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, I, I'm really glad I was able to speak into that because I think really, you know, us understanding what the ego is and understanding our relationship to the ego is one of the most important things we can ever do in life. And, and the truth is like most people don't even really know what the ego is. It's like you have this inner roommate that is constantly tormenting you and you just think that's normal right? It's, it's not normal. Like it's, it's actually very, very crazy, but our society has developed to such a place where this is how we're now living. 
And at no point in the evolution of human history did we think it was important to stop and put our egos in check until maybe now, right? Now might be the point when we're doing it. So yeah, like that's, that's what we're collectively as a race, as a species. One of the things we're learning at this stage of our evolution is how to put our egos in check. And that is going to allow us to move on to the next stage of what it means to be human, to the next evolution of human. We can't become a next higher version of humanity with our egos being out of control the way they are. It's just not going to work. We're going to continue to create chaos like we're creating in the world right now. Okay, next question. Um, Miriam Za. When in no contact, you are posting that you are out having fun and he comments something nice. Is it okay to only put uh, emoji hands like the prayer hands on his comments or not? Holidays coming up. If they congrats, should I reply? I want you to hear me, Miriam. Great question, by the way. I want you to hear me. You don't owe anyone anything. It is totally your right. Now, okay, let me, let me say this. If you have children with somebody, you owe them a little bit, all right? Like if, if you have children with someone, you owe them at least being a cooperative co-parent. I want to put that out there. That would be the caveat. If you have children with someone, you owe them at least being a cooperative co-parent. Aside from that, you don't owe anyone anything. Okay, yes, maybe if you like, if you had certain agreements and you financially owed someone something, you would want to clear that up, handle whatever you owed them, right? Like I, I get things like that. But that's it. Like you need to clean up whatever's there and then be done. So if you're no contact, meaning I don't want contact, I want space, I want to move on, I want to let this go. And you've communicated that to that person. And that person is commenting on your posts and things. Well, technically, and I mean, I'm kind of being semantic here, but technically they're disregarding your boundary. Do you see that? You said, I want no contact. I don't want to be in touch with you. And they're commenting on your posts. They're disregarding the boundary that you requested of them. You don't owe them an emoji hands. If you wanted to, you could block them. Or you can just ignore the comment altogether. Or you could delete the comment. Or if you just, if that's the easiest thing for you to do and you just want to be polite, you can give them emoji hands. But you don't owe them anything. If it's aggravating for you or frustrating for you that they're commenting on your posts, let that be a sign that your inner wisdom is telling you they are violating your boundary. And that might be where you block them or delete them. Right. So like, and and this is a great example of the prisons that we put ourselves in. Like feeling obligated to respond to somebody about like, no, I don't, I don't have to respond to anybody. Like when I, when I respond to comments on my social media, it's because I want to. And if I don't like a comment or I, I don't think the comment's appropriate, I'll delete it. If someone's being obnoxious, I'll block them. If you, like, you know, and you are free to do whatever you want on your social media. It's yours. Like, I, I want, I want you to allow yourself that freedom. You can post whatever you want. You can say whatever you want. You cannot say whatever you want. Like, people are reaching out to me. They're like, "Why haven't you spoken about the Palestinian conflict?" Which, by the way, I have a few times, but it's fine. They didn't see it, and that's okay. But people are reaching out to me like, "Why haven't you posted about the Palestinian conflict?" I'm like, "Cause I don't want to. Cause I don't think it's my place. Cause I'm not an expert on these matters. And it's my social media platform. I can say whatever I want to say or not say whatever I want to say." And I have, in, in regards to that conflict, I have spoken on what I have to say about that. And that's all I had to say about it. And like nobody can tell me what to do on my social media platforms. That is an extension of my authenticity. That is an extension of my truth. And I want you to give yourself the same permission. Okay, I know I might've taken that one a little far, but, I, but the reason I took it there was because I really want you to understand how free you are. 
And I really want you to see these imaginary prisons that you put up around yourself where you're obligated to do this or do that or say this or say that. You're not. You're not obligated to do any of it. You know, the the one thing I would say here is that you are obligated to honor your agreements. And technically, you're free to break your agreements if you want to. Now, if you do that consistently, you'll have low integrity, you'll have shitty relationships, people won't count on you, they won't like you, they won't trust you, you'll create conflict all over your life, right? So, like, the the commitment I have to myself is that I honor my agreements. When I tell someone I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that, I do it. But those are the only those are the only things I hold myself to. And I'd encourage you to do the same. So great question, lots of love. You don't owe them anything. Okay, next question from Mags Mags. How do you let go and trust the process fully? So very carefully. <laughs> no, I'm kidding when I say that. Um what I'm saying, what I want to say is that you do it a little at a time. You do it a little at a time. And like, you really can't do it any other way. There's, um, I've spoken before about A Course in Miracles. A Course in Miracles, I would say, is like my Bible, right? It's like, if there's, if there's one spiritual teaching that is like the first thing I look to, to understand how to contextualize life and God and my relationship with all of it, it's A Course in Miracles. For me, that's the thing I've found that really is closest to truth that we have on this planet right now. And in A Course in Miracles, it actually talks about the development of trust. And by the way, I also, I teach this in the Inspired Love Program. I teach the the development of trust. And basically what that is, is it's exactly what you're talking about, Mags, where trust is not something that happens in an instant. Trust happens by finding it within yourself to open up just a little bit of space to see a new possibility. So if, if you think about it like this, like your ego kind of has like a, a stronghold on your life, right? Your ego's got everything all locked up. It's got like a stronghold on your life. It's got you by the throat. And the ego doesn't want to let any new possibility in. The ego wants to keep everything like it is because that's how it feels safe. If you can find the courage inside of yourself to open up just a little bit of space for a new possibility. Like just enough courage. Like maybe you'll just, what's an example of this? Let me think. It's like, okay, here, here's an example. Let's say that you've been on a few dates with someone and it's going well. You're really into the person. You think they're into you. You're getting excited about it. You're starting to imagine maybe we could be together. Maybe we could have a life together. Maybe it would look like this or look like that, right? You're doing all this stuff. And you're getting excited. You're looking forward to this. You're thinking something real is developing. And then this person comes to you and they say, listen, it's been great getting to know you, but I'm just not feeling the connection I'm looking for. And I don't want to take this any further. And you feel like that sinking feeling, that drop, that I, you know, you know that feeling. We all know that feeling, right? So you feel that sinking feeling. It's just like, ah, oh, like the wind is taken out of your sails the letdown, the disappointment. And then comes the ego. And the ego says, well, you should have done this. He wouldn't have have left you if you did this, or if you said this, or you shouldn't have done that. I can't believe you told him that. That That was so stupid. You never should have told him that. And this is all the ego, right? It's all the control structure, the protective structure, trying to tell you what you should have done or could have done to avoid that pain. If only this, if only that. You could have avoided that pain. This is why it never works out for you. This is why people don't like you. You're not enough. You're never going to find someone. This is all the ego, right? It's all trying to maintain its view of life, its perspective, its perception by reinforcing it, by continuing to validate that, right? It maintains its perception of life by doing that. Now, when you, in a situation like that, In a situation like that, when you can look at that and you can resist the temptation to take it personally, when you can resist the temptation to think I should have done this or I should have done that or I shouldn't have done this or I shouldn't have done that, when you can resist the temptation to make it about you, 
Oh, I'm not enough. Or to make it about the future. Oh, this is never going to happen for me. Or make it about the past. Why does this always happen to me? Why can't I just find someone who will love me, right? Like when, if you can resist the temptation to go into all of that about what's wrong with you and what you should have done or shouldn't have done and why doesn't it happen and it's never going to happen, resist the temptation to go into all of that and just accept what's happening now. Okay, he's looking for someone else. I'm not who he was looking for. That's okay. I'm grateful that I'm not continuing on in a relationship with someone who doesn't want to be with me. And I'm grateful that he's not continuing on in a relationship with someone that he doesn't want to be with because that would just cause more problems down the road. So, okay, he wants something else. I hope he finds it. And I want something else because I just simply want someone who wants me. So, you know, it's easy for me. Like, I don't want him. He doesn't want me. That settles it for me, right? And if you can just accept that and surrender into that, without letting your ego take control of the experience and tell you what the experience means and tell you the implications of that for your future and all of it, right? If you can just be with that and accept that and let that in, what's going to happen is you're going to open up just a little bit of space for you to start to see and experience a new possibility in life. Oh, Maybe when someone doesn't want me, that doesn't mean there's something wrong with me. Oh, maybe when someone doesn't want me, that doesn't mean I'm not lovable or valuable. Maybe when someone doesn't want me, that doesn't automatically mean that it's never going to happen for me. Maybe when someone doesn't want me, that doesn't automatically mean that I should have withheld or adjusted myself to be more acceptable for them. Maybe it's just okay that sometimes certain people don't want certain people. Maybe that's okay, right? And when you open that up, you are opening yourself up to a broader possibility in life, a broader perspective on life and what things mean and who you are and what your place is in this grand design of life. And when you open up to that broader perspective and you can really let that in and receive that, what's happening is you are trusting a little more than you ever have before. And so then you do that again, and you do it again, and you do it again. And with each challenge you confront in life, with each fear that you have, with every time you doubt yourself, with every disappointing experience, and on and on and on, you just keep doing that. You just keep opening up a little bit more space, the willingness to see it differently, the willingness to feel differently about it, the willingness to have it mean something different. The more you open yourself up, the more you trust. Is this making sense? Tap that heart a few times if it's making sense. Because this is how trust is developed. Trust is developed one specific situation at a time. One challenge at a time. One scenario at a time. By choosing to trust what's happening now. By by choosing not to go into fear about it, right? Like we could say fear is the opposite of trust. When you trust, there's no fear. When you're afraid, you're not trusting. And so when you experience something in life that scares you or challenges you or activates your survival system, you have the opportunity to choose to not go into fear about it. And every time that you choose not to go into fear, you are strengthening your trust. And I just want to share this too. I want to share how this has unfolded for me because I do things now on a regular basis, like daily or weekly. I do things now that just a few years ago, I could have never imagined myself doing. And the reason I'm able to do that is because my trust has strengthened. And I want to bring it back to the topic we're talking about today where you are unconditionally supported by the universe. So when you make that choice to open up that little bit of trust, the universe is going to bring you something to validate that. Now, it might be something small in the beginning. 
right? But you are going to send yourself a sign. You are going to send yourself a message that's going to say to you, it's okay. Keep going. Take another step. And with each new step you take, those signs and those manifestations will get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and more complete and start to occupy larger domains of your life. And you'll see your relationships transform and you'll see your finances transform and you'll see everything else in your life transform because they are all going to transform into reflections of that trust. But let's just say, I'm going to make this very literal, and I don't necessarily think it is this literal, but just to illustrate this. Let's say you were 100% living in fear. And then you moved from 100% fear to 95% fear and 5% trust. The reflective mirror, right, and life, our external world, is operating as a reflective mirror for our internal world. Okay, so you moved from 100% fear to 95% fear and 5% trust. The reflective mirror, the external world is going to reflect that. So outside of you, you're going to have 95% fear-based images and 5% loving images. Now, what a lot of people do is they might take that 5% leap, but then they see the 95% fear and it's still terrifying, and they go, oh, no, and then that sends them back to 100%. And maybe they spend their whole life vacillating from 100 to 95 to 90 to 85 back to 100, right? I trust a little bit, but not really, and I always get freaked out, and I always go back to fear, and my ego always takes over, right? So what you would need to do if you're moving from that 100% to 95%, you would need to look for that 5% image of love. And you would need to find that in your world somewhere. And you would need to say to yourself, that is proof that it works. Here it is. Here's the proof right now. Here's my 5%. I'm looking around, 95% fear, but here's 5% love. And this is my proof that it works. And so I'm going to hold on to that. And I'm going to put my faith in that. I'm going to trust that. And I'm going to keep opening myself up. And then that 5% becomes 10%. And now you have 90% fear, but 10% love in your life. And if you keep moving with it, the amount of fear gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And the external world will reflect that. But you've got to be willing to accept those small signs. And, you know, what happens for what happens for a lot of us is we overlook the little signs. We think they're just not big enough. And I won't believe it until it's a huge sign. I won't believe it until I get the ultimate sign. I won't believe it until I have everything I want in my life exactly the way I want it. And the truth is, you'll never get there without believing those smaller signs first. And I'm just sharing the truth of my experience as I've come to understand it in my life. But the fact is, it works. I have, I have never trusted and been let down. Now, that might sound that might sound crazy to some of you because you might be like, I trust all the time and get let down. I meet a guy, I trust him, he ghosts me. <laughs> so you've got to you've got to zoom out a little bit. Because in the short term, I've definitely had disappointments. In the short term, I've definitely had heartaches. But when I zoom out a little bit and I see how each of those disappointments and heartaches was a small piece of a larger puzzle, and how those disappointment and heartaches shaped my consciousness and shaped my psyche to have a certain view of a situation, to understand a situation in a certain context, right? Then I saw what it was for. So if you think that you are trusting and being let down, two things. 
One, you need to zoom out, see the situation in a larger context. Two, you need to learn the lesson that is being offered to you in the disappointment, which I spoke about earlier. All right, so beautiful question, Mags. Thank you for asking the question. It's a beautiful question, and um, I, I love it. You know, trust, it's, it's one of the most important principles in our entire life is trust. It is the only thing that facilitates true greatness in life is your willingness to step out of the box that has been handed to you and become something greater than that. And when you choose to be something greater than that, you will be hated, you will be ridiculed, you will be judged, you will be mocked until you succeed at it. Then everyone will want to know how you did it. (laughs) Fucked up world we live in, isn't it? All right. So yes, trust. Thank you for the question, Mags. Beautiful question. I'm going to take one more question. Um... I'm going to take one more question. This is from Zitel. And uh, she says, I get that it's a gift when the potential partner shows themselves, but why is it still to accept the rejection? This is a good question. So you get that it's a gift when someone reveals themselves, but why is it still a gift to accept the rejection? This is good. This is juicy. You guys ready for this one? Ready for this one? All right. You know, the ego, and and this is how you know when you're thinking through the ego or not. The ego lives in very much a black and white system. There is good, there is bad, there is right, there is wrong, there is the desirable, there is the undesirable. Right? And this is the system that the ego lives in. The ego lives in this black, white, good, evil type paradigm. And so the ego is framing every situation through, if I get what I want, it's good. If I don't get what I want, it's bad, right? If I get it, it's good. If I don't get it, it's bad. And so if we look at it in a dating context, the ego says, if they like me, it's good. If they don't like me, it's bad. If they want me, I feel good. I feel validated. I feel lovable. I feel desirable. If they don't want me, I feel useless. I feel discardable. I feel unwanted, undesired, unlovable, right? In reality, in reality, in truth, we could say in God's perspective or in in your higher self's perspective of life, there is equal value in getting what you want and getting what you don't want. You see, there is no good or bad. There is no right or wrong. There is no good and evil. Those are judgments made by the ego. The truth is, there is just as much good in having someone like you and want to be with you as there is in having someone reject you. Those are both good things. And you say, why? Why is rejection a good thing? Well, there could be different reasons and it could be different for the person based on the situation. But let me just put it this way. One thing rejection can teach you is that your love of self is not dependent on another person's opinion of you. In fact, a lot of you will get rejected over and over and over and over again until you integrate that one truth. That your love of self is not conditional on someone else's opinion of you. So rejection is an amazing thing because every time you get rejected, it gives you the opportunity to look at yourself and what you believe you're worth. You know, I do this all the time with my content, right? So I'll put content on Instagram or TikTok, Facebook, and sometimes it's well-received, sometimes it's not well-received, right? Sometimes people disagree, which is fine. People can disagree. Sometimes people hate. Sometimes people personally attack me. Sometimes people say, you must not care about women or you must not care about people if you think this or you're, you're leading people down a bad road. I mean, people tell me all kinds of stuff, right? And every time I get that external rejection, it gives me an opportunity to look at what I said. And I go, oh, do I really believe what I said? Could I have worded it differently? Is this, do I feel this is actually true or do I feel I missed the mark on this one a little bit? 
right? So every rejection is actually sharpening my truth. It's actually clarifying my truth. And sometimes that person rejecting me and I say, no, I feel 100% about this and I come back even stronger with it. And sometimes I say, you know what? Maybe I was a little off on that. Maybe the next time I'll tweak it a little bit and I'll say it this way or I'll say it that way instead. But no matter which way it serves, it is sharpening my truth. And so the same thing could happen in a dating context, right? Someone rejects you and you got to ask yourself, am I unlovable? Am I, does that person's opinion define me? Or am I defined by something greater than that? You've got to ask yourself, how am I going to define myself in this situation? That person doesn't want me. Does that mean I don't want myself? That person doesn't love me. Does that mean I'm not lovable? Right? So the rejection is a gift. It sharpens you. It clarifies you. And the same way I said earlier, where someone might say something on a piece of content about me, and I might say, no, I feel very strongly about that, and I come back even stronger with the same message. Well, someone might tell you, you're not lovable. Or they might not say it in those words, but they might be like, I'm not that into this, or I don't find you that attractive, or whatever. And then you got to ask yourself, am I attractive? Well, what's attractive about me? What are my most attractive qualities? Am I demonstrating those qualities? Am I showing up in my most attractive qualities? Am I withholding them? Am I afraid to put my most attractive qualities out there? Right? And so in that, you might actually come back from that rejection being more yourself than ever before. Clarifying what are my most attractive qualities? How would I demonstrate those attractive qualities? How can I bring those out into the world in the most amazing way that will wow people? How can I present these attractive qualities in a way that's going to have people like blowing up my phone to see me again? Right? A rejection could call that forth from you. This is what I say is like, you've got to be willing to learn the lessons as they are handed to you. And any time that you feel like a victim to a situation, I'm not judging. You have every right to be a victim if you want to be. And as I've said, you have the full support of the universe behind you. If you want to be a victim, the universe will fully support you in that. It'll bring all kinds of perpetrators into your life and you will get to be a victim forever. And you have every right to do that. I'm not judging. If you want to do it, do it. Rock on with it. Tell me how it is. I don't think it feels good. Maybe you'll feel differently about it. But if you ever feel like a victim to a situation, again, you have every right to choose that. But you can also let that be a trigger for you. When I feel like a victim, ooh, I'm not learning my lesson here. Anytime I feel like a victim... I can trigger for myself that there is a lesson here that I am not learning. And that's powerful. Like that's how you level up in your life. That's how you reach higher levels of energy. So I'm going to close it out with that today. Um, Beautiful questions, beautiful questions. I I always love everything you, you share and you ask, um, you know, just so many beautiful things. And, and I, I love being able to speak into this. So thank you so much. Um, if anybody would like to uh, get some info about Inspired Love, I know I've shared a little bit about it today. And I just want to say that um, I've been talking a little bit about it on the, on the shows, but what we've done is we've converted it to an unlimited model. And what's so great about this unlimited model is one, you have a lifetime membership. So what does that mean? It means that you can join the coaching calls for as long as you want to. Um, In addition to coaching calls, we do breath work. We do different kinds of workshops, right? So you're going to be in this for life and you can take a break and come back if you want to. You can never come back again if you want to. You can stay forever if you want to. It's totally up to you. But there's, um, we're going to have the opportunity to work together for as long as you want. And I'm really excited about that because I really want to be able to see people all the way into that love that they're creating in their lives, right? So that's something I'm really excited about. Um, 
Other things I'm excited about this program are just that the value that's going to be there is so much more than before, right? Like the time that we're able to spend actually working live and coaching is so much more time than we had before. Um, the, the curriculum, because I'm not delivering it live in a timed session where I need to like cover a certain amount of things in a certain amount of time and make sure there's time for questions and coaching and stuff because the curriculum is in its own format. Now I'm actually able to develop the curriculum and make it bigger and more complete than it's ever been before. Um, I have a master breath worker coming in once a month to guide breath work with us. And breath work is just one of the most powerful methods of catharsis and release and forgiveness and healing, right? So we're doing breath work as a group once a month. Um, you know, we're hosting different kinds of workshops and things to just delve in and do deep dives on different kinds of topics. And, you know, there's just, there's so much that is happening in this program that just was not available before. So I am just, I am thrilled. We opened on November 1st. Um, we actually have our first live coaching session tonight, which I'm so excited to meet with the group of ladies. I think we have about 15, 16 people in there right now. And I'm just really excited to meet with the ladies and, and um, open up our, our first live session tonight. And, uh, and yeah, we're just, we're going to keep growing the community, growing the program as we move along. So we're starting small. It will get bigger over time, but, but I promise I'm going to make sure there's room for everyone. And, um, and yeah, that's what we're doing in the program. That's what it's all about. So if anybody is interested in um, getting more details about the program, you can email me at Shane and Fatima at the living relationship.com. You could also just shoot me a message on Instagram and, and ask for the information. We'll send it to you. Uh, the way it works is if you want the details, what we'll do is we'll set up a call with you and um, we'll just uh, we'll chat, uh, set you up with one of my team members, chat for about an hour or so and just kind of get a glimpse of where you're coming from, what you want to create in your life, what you want to use the program for. Um, we'll be honest with you, you know, if we think the program is something that will serve you in that way or, or if it won't. And um, you'll have the opportunity to choose if, if you want to jump in or not. But um, that's the way we do it. So if you'd like to get on a call with one of the team members and just um, have them tell you everything about the program, answer your questions. Um, yeah, that'll that'll be available. So yeah, Laura, I see you on here and I'm looking forward to it too. Yeah. Laura says she can't wait for the meeting tonight. I can't wait either. Very, very much looking forward to it. So anyway, um, I say all this to say that if you are interested in working with me, um, there's a lot we can do that we can't do on a podcast, right? There's, there's a lot we can do working together live that we just can't do on a podcast. And, um, and I would love it if you're ready to really do that work, if you're ready to make that significant transformation in your life and move from a basis of fear to a basis of trust and love. That's really what the program's about, and that's what we do. So um, we'd love to have you in there with us if that's something that you're ready for. Uh, that being said, I want to go ahead and say thank all of you for joining me live today. Um, those of you who are listening to the podcast, thank you, and I always appreciate you tuning in with me. Um, I will be back every Tuesday, 12 p.m. Eastern time with a live stream of the podcast and um, always looking forward to it. So thank you, sending you lots of love, many blessings to wherever you are, and I'll see you back here next Tuesday. Take care, everybody. Talk soon. Bye. Thanks again for checking out the show. Please subscribe on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on the most. And I would love it so much if you leave a review and tell people what you think of us. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at The Living Relationship to connect more closely. And I'm grateful to be supporting you on your journey to love.